Welcome, everybody, to October 2nd legislative session. All rise for the pledge. I pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Fister, could you read the roll? Council President Kinnear. Present. Council Member Kath or Bingle, sorry. Here. <laughs> Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Ulrich. Present. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Let the record reflect that Council Member Zapone is absent. He's here, but he's just not here. Okay, so first up we have poetry at the podium with Michelle Pointel. Come on up. Good evening. Tonight I will read for you South Hill, Spokane. When we first came, the cows still grazed in the field on Regal. Just across the road, we considered an apartment facing north onto a scraggly field, which the next year gulped gone into eateries and a parking lot. Time passed. Traffic, once paced with intermittent pauses, crescendoed steadily into constant tremor of rumbling newcomers. Still at night, Orion passes through, sprinkling star dreams to filter down through the dark. Each spring, the bullfrogs one block over rouse us to waken from winter. Robins in the courtyard wield territory-defining tunes. Sea green lighthouse of ponderosa pine, South Hill stands sure and true. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council President, um, so we will have a certificate for you that we'll put in the mail, and I apologize, we usually have one that we present. But I also want to say you used a word that I just loved. Was it uh, in the beginning of the poem, uh, trickily? What was it? Scraggly. Scraggly. Thank you. I haven't heard that word in a long time. It made my day. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, proclamations are National Disability Employment Awareness Month, read by Councilmember Stratton. And we have Michael Skog. Are you here? Ah, oh, great. So when she's finished, you can come up and say a few words. And there's a lot of meaning that he is here because I have known him a very long time. Okay. Okay, whereas the purpose of National Disability Employment Awareness Month is to educate about disability employment issues and celebrate the many and varied contributions of America's workers with disabilities, and whereas workplaces welcoming of the talents of all people, including people with disabilities, are a critical part of our efforts to build an inclusive community and strong economy and whereas activities during this month will reinforce the value and talent people with disabilities add to our workplaces and communities and affirm the city of Spokane's commitment to an inclusive community that increases access and opportunities to all, including individuals with disabilities. Now therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, mayor of the city of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim October 2023 as Disability Employment Awareness Month in Spokane and urge businesses and citizens to embrace the talents and skills that individuals with disabilities bring to our workplaces and our community. Good to see you. Oh, I wasn't sure if I could give you a picture. Oh, okay. There you go. You can send your mom. Yes. I dropped off the. Send me an email. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, council members and Mayor Woodward. I am here on behalf of the Washington State Department of Services for the Blind. Um, 
we appreciate your recognition of Disability Employment Awareness Month. Our organization is dedicated to helping um, low vision, blind, and deaf blind individuals of all ages across Washington um, learn skills of independence and to provide them with the tools and training to get to their desired goals and be a part of their community. So thank you again for your time, um, your recognition and acknowledgement of Disability Employment Awareness Month. Thank you. Next, we have a salutation for Spokane Transit Authority, and I wonder if, are the staff here? Oh, you guys are sitting in the back. Come on up. So as the board chair of STA, I am reminded every day how valuable the employees are and what a great job they do. So this is in recognition of something that was really, truly above and beyond. Whereas Spokane Transit Authority, STA, provides public transportation services to the cities of Airway Heights, Cheney, Liberty Lake, Medical Lake, Millwood, Spokane, and Spokane Valley, and tracks over 30,000 rides each and every day through 50 routes. And whereas STA leadership was contacted on August 18th, 2023, by Washington State Patrol to assist in a life or death emergency evacuation of the city of Medical Lake, due to a raging and quickly spreading wildfire. And whereas the STA leadership responded immediately to the call with minimal service interruption, dispatching 10 buses and 15 vans to evacuate residents to the evacuation center that was initially located at Cheney High School. And whereas STA further mobilized to address rapidly changing conditions and began transporting displaced evacuees from Cheney High School to Spokane Falls Community College because the fire had jumped Interstate 90 and was encroaching into Cheney. And whereas STA staff successfully transported people that utilize wheelchairs and other mobility devices, as well as pets, to Spokane Falls Community College, which was designated as the secondary shelter. And whereas STA employees, including dispatch teams, road supervisors, and coach and van operators worked late through the night, remained calm in a challenging environment, communicated well, and adapted to difficult and evolving situations throughout the night. Now therefore, I, Lori Kinnear, Spokane City Council President, on behalf of the citizens of, of Spokane, hereby salute Spokane Transit Authority employees for their contributions to protecting citizens and assisting with the challenging evacuation of an entire city. The City of Spokane thanks them for their brave work, ensuring people, their pets, and belongings were safely moved to the evacuation shelter. Please say a few words. Thank you for your recognition. Um, our employees were um, were ready and available to to respond when called upon. Um, the employees that stand behind me were actually personally involved in the responsive efforts to uh, to respond to and actually evacuate the the city of Medical Lake, transporting many people um, uh, and their their pets and belongings, just as you mentioned. Um, so it's an incredible opportunity to um, to to be recognized to come here and 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 for for your great words. Thank you. Community report, um, Kaylin Robertson, Safe Communities Partnership, Educational Service District 101. Welcome. Hello. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Kaylin Robertson. I work with uh, Northeast Washington Educational Service District 101's uh, Youth Build Spokane, uh, also known as the Spokane Service Team. Um, it is located in the East Central neighborhood, um, right behind uh, the Old Flame on Spring and Altamont. 
Youth Build is a Department of Labor recognized pre-apprenticeship program where youth who are 16 to 24 can come and finish their secondary education while also experiencing hands-on learning of either construction or healthcare. Uh, construction covers a little bit of everything in the trades, while he healthcare has a certified nursing assistant, uh, medical assistant phlebotomy, and community healthcare worker. At the end of youth build programming, they will have obtained certification based on which track they picked in the beginning of the program. <clears throat> Um, youth have to be released from high school or have to have a referral from the school counselor, which uh, uh, we have other eligibilities, such as being from a low-income family, which is like eligible for state assistance, state assistance sorry, um, migrant youth, um, youth offenders, such as juvenile probation or house arrest, or um, child of an incarcerated parent. Um, the, and the construction track here at Youth Build, members will learn the basic construction skills, such as safety, hand tools, power tools, blueprint, and material handling, uh, with also teaching the youth math and employability skills. Uh, members in the construction track will actually tour a lot of the local apprenticeships in the, in the Spokane community. Um, Brandy Langhofer, our director, has done a great job building those networks for us and the youth uh, who come through the program. Uh, youth here will also get the opportunity to help uh, build houses in the community. Currently, we are at Napa and Mallon. Um, building a house from foundation up, or there we will be selling the house to a low-income family. Um, Wednesdays, um, the Youth Build Construction crew gets to go out and volunteer for um, Habitat for Humanity, where they also work on building houses that are going to be um, for uh, families transitioning from homelessness. And um, when they leave there, they will have their National uh, Center of Construction, Education, and Research CERT, which is very needed and respected for the local apprenticeships, uh, their CPR, and will help with them either join the apprenticeship program or further, further in their education in college. Uh, for the medical track, uh, members will learn a different variety of skills from skilled nursing facilities, hospitals, and clinics uh, through partnerships with the local community colleges and employers. Youth are to observe and gain better understanding of what day-to-day -day looks like in a, in different healthcare settings and positions. Um, the programming for Youth Build is six to nine months with a year follow-up, and you also get to have a team of people who care about you, who, who aren't just gonna say, hey, you can go find this resource, or hey, you can find a rental assistant here. We're gonna make sure that we guide those young folks to there. So we also help with like uh, mental health, um, rental assistance, um, also um, housing as well. We have a full kitchen and food pantry so youth can make sure to eat before they have hard work. And the best part about being a Youth Build member is that you can also learn, uh, earn a training stipend uh, paid every two weeks, which won't get in the way of your uh, state assistance as well. Um, the end goal of Youth Build is to help underserved youth with a placement, a career, or apprenticeship that will set that young person up for life. And also having the support that they need just to tell them, hey, have a good job. You know, have a, do a good job, have a great day, you can do it. Um, here at Youth Build, we also provide space for, for youth after school, Tuesday through Friday, Tuesday through Thursday, we're at, at the Spoken Service Team from three to 6 p.m. Uh, Fridays, we rent out space at the Redeemer, Redeemer Church in Spokane Valley, mm -hmm. where youth can just play basketball and dodgeball. And let me tell you, basketball saves a lot of my young, young members' lives. Um, we use these times simply let kids be kids. You know, we all know, we've all been teenagers. We all know the pressure of being a young person can be to be exposed to things that make you grown or make you cool. Here at Youth Build, we do the opposite. We, we encourage these kids to chase their childhood dreams. And we also have the resources to help them do so. Um, I would conclude with another short story. I was, when I'm 20, I was 20, 21 years old, freshly out of Spokane County Jail, determined hey, I have to for my probation, I had to either finish my education or, and get a job. Very hard for a young person if you don't know what you're doing. I ran into the Next Generation Zone where I met my director, Brandy Langhofer. She worked there as a career specialist. I told her the things I was struggling on. She said, I have the perfect program for you, Youth Build. She brought a young guy in, his name is Steve, who became my uh, construction trainer. He said, if you want better, we can provide better. Either way, get ready to work. Um, I graduated in six months with all my certs and my GED. 
and off of probation, no violations. Three years after, Brandy Langhofer became the director of Youth Build. Two years after that, we, she wrote an Office of Juvenile Justice uh, Delinquency and Prevention grant, called me, said she had a really nice idea. Brought me in, now I'm helping youth who are gang impacted in our program. And so the point of the story is, I was a troubled youth, I found people who were for me, and then I came around for circle, circle and all those people are my coworkers. So um, they just build, build things around the individual, not give you a box and tell youth you either fit in it or you fail. Well, that's all I have. Questions? Go ahead. Just a quick comment. Well, thank you for sharing your story, but it sounds like they really gave you community. And I think that's what a lot of our young people are lacking. We can have all these things, but if there isn't really a true sense of community, it's not as successful for some as it could be for others. So thank you for showing up tonight. Appreciate you guys. Councilmember Orlick. I also just want to say thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. And in a previous career, I've sent a number of youth to your program, and I've seen the results firsthand. So please don't stop. We need you. Thank you. Right. Anybody else? Thank you. It, amazing stories, and it's heartwarming and uplifting. That's how I like to start our meeting, with something that's positive. So thank you. Thanks so much. Right, we're going to switch gears and do open forum. Just a reminder, because I have to say this, no clapping, no cheering, no booing, no public outbursts. And we have people who are going to, um, we have two minutes. And the open forum is a limited public forum. All matters discussed in the open forum shall relate to the affairs of the city. And individuals speaking during open forum shall their, address their comments to me. And then the most important part is duty of mutual respect. It is the constant duty of each council member to treat each other, city staff board and commission appointees and the public with respect. Likewise, all persons who attend a council meeting or inter interact with council members or council staff in any type of forum or communication, regardless of the form or format, must act respectfully toward all persons. So. Let's have the first three people come up. Rick Bocook, Megra, you're online, and then Denaro Yard Bush. Probably going to keep talking about this until you get tired of me. <clears throat> but community protection zones, um, give me an example of where one is. YWCA, YMCA. They do not allow any kind of sexual predators in there at all. They did have one person come in there taking his clothes off. They kicked him out immediately. But um, in another state, uh, Florida, it tells you what a level three is. Their status is legally indicates a sexual predator. So I want you to keep this in your mind. That's what is at Northtown Mall. Dean McGinnis works at Selex Cell Phone. He is a sexual predator. Now they have... Um, the trampoline place there, they have the blue zoo there, they have a daycare there, they have the theater there, and there's an individual that I know, he said he went there to talk to the management, and they just basically said, they know about him, but why do you care? I'm gonna keep repeating that. This is the Northtown Mall management. Why do you care if somebody like that is working? Now, a couple of days ago, I was at the plaza, and this is one of the worst kind. This guy is a child molester, and he sat next to me, and I cussed him out, told him to get, it, get away from me. And another person cussed him out, but his crime? He raped an eight-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl. So you think about, this is the kind of people, maybe you guys won't interact with them, but people out here that take the buses and are walking, we have to deal with these kind of people. We have to, we have to hold ourselves back from wanting to do very bad things. But they should not be out in, they should not be around us. They, they, I don't care if they get banned forever. You know, I, you put them on an island. They don't, they should not be around people at all. This guy at the mall, I don't know what, what needs to be done about him, but something needs to be done. And I don't know what you guys know, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here the Rick, federal laws, Rick, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. point, of, point of information. Yes. So. 
Rick, just an FYI, we have been talking about this, and uh, Council President Kinnear and I spoke about it later today. It, it is something that we're actively working on, on that. Thanks for bringing that yeah. up. Okay. Megra, you want to press star three? Go ahead, Megra. Spokane's criminal legal system discriminates. The JFA Institute, in a study paid for by Spokane County, released their 2019 report noting that black people are jailed at 13 times the rate of white people, a discrepancy that cannot be explained by crime rate or crime severity. Recently retired Spokane County Public Defender Tom Krasiminski spoke to the Spokesman Review in 2020 about reforming the criminal justice system. Quote, at some point, I hope there's a look back at who we've incarcerated and do we need to be incarcerating them. Superior Court Judge Marianne Moreno has spoke w spoken with the Inlander about Spokane County Prosecutor Larry Haskell's selective overcharging. Quote, when you have these overarching policies that say we're going to prosecute you to the max, it does not make for smart justice. It doesn't save the community from this individual who gets out the same way they went in or worse. And then here we are again. We can lock all these people up and spend 150 bucks a day, but I don't think we're getting enough bang for our buck here. Former Spokane Regional Law and Justice Administrator Maggie Yates wrote in her resignation email that not only are 20% of people leaving Spokane County Jail homeless, but 60% of the people coming into the jail have behavioral health disorders. That will not be cured or helped by incarceration where they lack access to their prescribed medications and are at risk of losing their jobs. We do not need a new jail. All of these criminal legal experts agree that what we do need to solve these problems we keep hearing about is instead funding therapeutic alternatives such as mental health services, addiction treatment, and shelter for the increasing number of Spokaneites who cannot afford the increase in housing costs. In 2020, due to the global COVID-19 pandemic, the Spokane County jail population was decreased by almost 40%. It took a global health crisis to put into action what all these experts and more have been saying needs to happen for years. Yates studied the crime statistics and told the Inlander in 2022 that she did not see any increase in the recidivism rates from violent criminals. Megra. The released people were Megra. not causing it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, Donara, Yard Bush, then Tanya, then Will. Hewlings. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Dinara Yardbush, and I am a current senior at Gonzaga Preparatory High School. Uh, I had a question regarding the ongoing epidemic involving fentanyl usage among not only adults but youth today um, within our Spokane community. I was recently informed of the funding that has been put forward towards organizations with this issue and trying to raise awareness about it, um, but I'm wanting to know what legislation can be enacted to protect our citizens through utilizing both accountability and compassion to overcome this epidemic. So, Donara, this is for you to talk, yeah. we're to listen, so we don't interact. Okay. And what I would advise is you contact one of the council members who can give you that information directly. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And if you left your contact details, we'd be happy to reach out and connect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Tonya, Will, and Kylie Prater. Prater. Thank you, council members. Um, I think the um, people that have pays right now, you know, pays, you know, need to ask their people, you know, if they need, if they owe anyone money or not, you know, too, because there's some people that are their own pays and they, they keep asking other people for money downtown. And they and they say they'll they'll pay them back all the time, and they don't, you know. And they and they're teaching kids, you know, how to not pay people back, you know, when they're downtown. And and someone too needs to go downtown, you know, and tell them they if they if they don't pay them back, then they can't be asking for no more money. From other people, too, you know, and and I think I think people too that are like sex offenders too, you know, they need to be put in other homes, 
you know, that, that are, are with other sex offenders, too, you know, because they, so they will, so they will be watched, you know, and see if they do anything to other children or not, too. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah. Will, Kylie Prater, and then Jay McPherson. Good evening. My name is Will Hewlings, and I'm MAGA Republican. So that's what Joe Biden called me, you know, Republicans. So I, what I want to speak on is today, leaving my apartment. I live downtown. But as I was about to leave, I looked across the street, guy sitting on the sidewalk. No big deal. The problem I had was when he started yelling at people. Now, I don't know who he's yelling at, but he's yelling at somebody walking down the sidewalk. So I watched him for a few more minutes, and guess what he did? He pulled out a piece of foil and started hitting the foil. Right there, as people walk by on their lunch break, some guy is sitting there yelling at people, and then there's a lady sitting with him in a wheelchair. Then a, an hour or two later, on the corner of Howard and Sprague, somebody got assaulted. Yesterday morning, somebody got assaulted that same area. The parking lot over there, like the corner of Howard and Sprague, they, it's infested with drug addicts. And I'm glad, and I'm going to give a kudos out to SPD because they were over there doing their job. They, I, don't, I guess they, they had a bunch of people sitting there, and they, they obviously were being detained. But that's what needs to happen if we're going to solve the problem with all this drug addicts and people because obviously they don't care about normal people that live downtown because they're addicted. They just go and do what they do. But anyways, thank you. Thank you. Right, um, then uh, Kylie Prater, and then Jay after Kylie, and then Antoine. Hello, and good evening. My name is Kylie Prater, and I am a current senior at Gonzaga Prep. And I'm wanting to know more about an issue I heard earlier today referring about weed killer that is going into our sewage system, because it's kind of concerning about um, how, if it's sustainably safe or not, for humans in our rivers as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. And again, if you want more information, give your contact information to one of us and we can get you more. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, then Jay McPherson, Antoine, and Alice Hawa. Thank you. <clears throat> I've been born and raised in Spokane. I'm concerned uh, about recent events in our city and in this chamber that have revealed what I think is a need for a resolution in defense of the constitutional rights of biblical Christians. It seems the actions have obscured biblical Christians' rights. So a biblical Christian is someone who adheres to the Holy Scriptures, believes that the Bible is God's authoritative message to, to us. But what I call a cultural Christian is someone that goes along with the crowd and will pick and choose elements of Christianity when they feel it helps their subjective viewpoints. For example, in the mid-1800s in America, it was cultural Christians who went along with human slavery because it was culturally acceptable at the time to do so, and it was advantageous for them or they were too afraid to speak out. But it was biblical Christians who were willing to stand alone. Many sacrificed so much to <coughs> abolish slavery and free slaves through the Underground Railroad because they followed the teachings of the Bible. Also, it was biblical Christians who stood up against National Socialism in Hitler's Germany. Cultural Christians went along with the new political trends and tolerated Hitler's aggressive activism until it was too late. A biblical Christian to me is someone who surrenders to Jesus and his word. We don't get to choose most of what we believe about the spiritual world, about moral values, uh, about sin, righteousness, and sexuality. I listened to the comments at last Monday's meeting multiple times and I'm convinced that many on this council believe we have to surrender the Bible because a protected privileged class who votes for many on this council claim they felt unsafe. 
Violence was the furthest thing from that worship service that me and many in my congregation attended. But we don't agree with the worldview of at least four of the seven members here. That is, I felt there were repeated lies and easily called us names, like Christian nationalists and white supremacists. Madam President, Councilwoman Karen Stratton said, these events, talking about the, Jay, I'm out of time, I'm sorry. Time's up. Thanks. Thank you for your time. Uh, Antoine, Alice, Wa, and Ron McKierney. My name is Antoine. I'm a Spokane resident. Okay, I just want to say, like, what Rick said about the predators, you know, and the thugs, you know, or the drug addicts that uh, Will mentioned, you know, like, uh, Something needs to be done about that because when I was volunteering on Sunday mornings over there where we feed the homeless, I mean, they were doing it right in front of us, and they don't care, you know. I mean, I, mean, I don't know. What else can you say? You know, who, who's going to speak for them if they don't have no respect for anybody? You know, we need to allow the, the, the police department to do their job, you know. That's how, you know, I mean, something needs to be done because these are the people that hurt innocent people that when they're out, about on you know in the streets, so yeah, maybe we need to look at it seriously. And you know, if they do their job, leave them alone. You know, let the police do their job. You know, they'll learn. There's no other way you can do it. That's what you call top law. You know. Okay, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Alice, Hawa, Ron McCary, and Eugene Knowles. I moved to Spokane in 2017 to work for Pet Panda. Back then, working in the cannabis industry under legal conditions seemed like a dream come true. However, as I simmered in the bottom ranks of that lifeless company, I started to notice their cult-like behaviors, like reminding me of how disposable I was in this family. We received an email from the CEO stating that there is no need to form a union, as they prefer to work individually with each employee. That was true until I started to support, uh, express support for the union. In the spring, when construction picked up and the bus schedules became more tentative, I adjusted my, schedule about my work schedule about 20 minutes, uh, which they had to legally accommodate. Unfortunately, the construction only got more intense, and thus, I needed to adjust my schedule again. When I asked for this change, I was told that they, only, they were only legally required to accommodate me once, and I eventually got fired due to attendance. Uh, such a critical attitude becomes even more toxic when paired with their shady business practices. The most recent depravity is the indictment of Rob McKinley, who helped facilitate a supplement scam in Idaho. Now, you may think this has nothing to do with uh, Spokane or any of y'all, but however, this kind of business practice leads a company to engage in tax loopholes to deprive uh, Spokane of the, uh, of the much needed taxes to help it and its citizens flourish as a community. This will eventually cost the residents of Spokane more due to this company not paying their fair share after spitting in the face of its consumers and the law itself. I implore you to investigate this bad faith enterprise that is Fat Panda and crack down on any tax loopholes. This company is no more ethical than drug companies that flourish in the unregulated black market. Prove that the city of Spokane is better than that and properly regulate this company before it becomes another corporation that holds the government on a leash. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ron. And then Eugene, and then Justin Holler, and then Sherry Barnett. Yeah, I was here last week and uh, just wanted to come back and address the council a little bit further. First off, um, thank you for having an open forum. It's really great that citizens can come and just share whatever is concerning to the city and concerning to themselves, and I commend you for that. Uh, last week, um, as I was here, I was listening to the testimony, listening to uh, even the comments from the council, and I, I realized how divisive the issue of denouncing the mayor was in the community. And I know that she went forth and attended a, a Let Us Worship event, and I attended one of those a year ago, and I found it to be much like a concert with some prayer mixed in. Never heard any hateful rhetoric, never heard anything threatening, and I find that the mayor being denounced is a denouncement of myself as well, 
or anybody who would attend an event like that. And I find it as a, an announcement of, of a people's uh, freedom of, of assembly and freedom of thought and, and how they want to worship and, and gather. Anyways, I want to encourage the council to not be influenced by the alleged and ugly accusations and views that are out there in the community that are oftentimes spread by various groups, various people, even the media. I encourage the council to present a, a positive image, a positive message to their congregates, to the people of this city. Let's be about unity. Let's be about peace. And in that spirit, last week, um, Councilman Cathcart, I commend you that you called for transparency. I ask that you would do that again, that there would be transparency, because through that, through truth, through light, comes true healing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eugene, and then Justin and Sherry Barnett. Council President and uh, members of the council, I uh, I was here last week as well, and uh, there was so much to unpack. Uh, my situation was I didn't want to speak last week until I got both sides of the issue, and being here last week, there was a lot of sides and a lot of issues. So because there was so much to unpack, I decided let me just in two minutes give the two conclusions that I have. One, I'd like to thank the council for bringing the issue to the public's awareness. And two, th this is October, the season known as October Surprise. So in politics, things are gonna happen in October and the way the calendar falls for the voting in uh, November, there might be a little November surprise. So what happened last week, from my view, was an October surprise. I'm a uh, homeless advocate. I'll be glad when October and November are over so I can come back and get on my issue, homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Justin Holler, then Sherry Barnett. Hi, my name's Justin Haller. Once again, I'm still disappointed with most of the things that are going on. Um, today, um, I'm here to oppose the idea of the bike lane, or the, um, sorry, misspoke, the uh, one lane being closed on division, which apparently is not STA's thought, it's yours, and four of you are on the board of directors of STA, which seems like a conflict of interest, considering that you, you, you um, they use our taxpayers' money to subsidize the transit. Um, if you think it's a good idea, please feel free to drive your car on division at 4 p.m. on Friday and see if it's a good idea. See, and because the north-south freeway isn't going to be built for any foreseeable future, especially if King Inslee III keeps stealing our money, which is a whole other thing. Um, you might want to ask him where our money is, especially the pot tax dollars. It's a completely new revenue stream for you guys that you just don't seem to care about. And where's the 50000 from the parking company that you guys gave up to the Canadian company? Where's that money? Um, the other thing is there are a lot of bike lanes that are uncleared of debris year-round, or they have icebergs, or they have snow and or ice in them, and makes them almost impassable to use, especially on ash, which is in the district of someone who is not even paying attention to me. Um, and it's very frustrating, especially on Crestline. Uh, and Illinois is a complete joke the way they built that. No one who rides a bike actually designed that because you can't turn north coming from Illinois without coming to a grinding halt. But if you could clear the debris uh, on the bike lanes, if you are steering us away from our personal use cars, which you seem to be doing with feverish intent, if that's the case, then clear the bike lanes. But you can't have it both ways. You can't take away our cars 
and encourage us to, to use public transportation and our bicycles when you simultaneously won't maintain the, the, the very paths that you, you force us to use. Time's up, thank you. Sherry oh, Burnett. by the way, candy corn sucks. <laughs> Whatever. I agree with him. Yes, I'm Sherry Burnett, and I live in the city of Spokane. Um, President Kinnear and all members of the city council. I sort of hate to do this in a way because it has been already said, but I do not believe any of you on the majority who voted against Mayor Nadine Woodward to, <coughs> to shame her were at that concert. I was at that concert. It was loving. People were praying for the people who were in the fire. They were praying for all of you. There were brown, yellow, white babies, old people. There was no hate, zero. If you had been there, you would never have voted for this. And furthermore, she has a right to worship as she sees fit. This is a bad, this is a bad thing, a bad precedent in this city. Um, enough said, it was loving. They prayed not just for Spokane, for the city, for the state, for the nation, and for the entire world. Prayers and tears and love were all you were gonna find there. And then I, I see in the paper that they are thinking again of breaching the dams, the Snake River dams. Now, the, the salmon are important, yes, and they're working on that problem. But there's so much more irrigation, recreation, above all being able to spare floods and, and help in drought. The dams are maybe a tenth of hydropower also. They're very important. If you want to turn it to a dust bowl, get rid of the dams. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, dear. Okay. We have uh, board and commission appointments. Terry, did you want to read those? Yes. Appointing Garrett Jones and Luis Garcia to the Spokane County Regional Animal Protection Service Scraps Advisory Board to continue through December 31, 2023. Thank you. And we've had a lot of information passed before us regarding scraps. This board is being revitalized. It hasn't been up and running for quite some time, so uh, we have two of our finest that will be serving on this board. Any comments before we go ahead? Yeah, no, uh, no comments on the specific appointment. Just a reminder for folks that study session on Thursday, we will be having some additional conversation on the scraps contract and the dispute resolution process. So. All right. Let's take a voice vote. All those in favor, aye. 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 There are no nays, so, or noes, sorry. So, good. Let's let them know that they're the proud members of the new advisory board. And next up is our consent agenda. And we have one deferral, which is number two on our consent. And Terry, if you will read that, that'd be great. <clears throat> Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, pre-approval for fleet services to purchase three Ford F-250 or equivalent diesel service trucks for the water department, $285,000. Item number two was deferred to October 9, 2023 agenda. Item number three, memorandum of understanding between the City of Spokane, Spokane County, and the City of Spokane Valley regarding the disparate jurisdiction relationship for Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program grant funding. Number four, memorandum of understanding with Spokane County to apply for and split the fiscal year 2023 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program grant total amount $214,815, city $118,148, and county $96,667. Number five, low bid of Shamrock Paving Incorporated Spokane for the Maple Ash Chip Sale Project $1,765,000. An administrative reserve of $176,500, which is 10% of the contract price, will be set aside, various neighborhoods. Number six, in a local agreement between the City of Spokane and the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission outlining duties and responsibilities around vehicle repairs and maintenance. Number seven, report of the mayor of pending, cla of pending claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of parks and library. 
through September 22, 2023, total $13,435,806.82. With Parks and Library claims approved by the respective boards, warrants excluding Parks and Library total $12,769,847.07. Number eight, City Council meeting minutes for September 18, 2023. Thank you. We have one person signed up, Will Healings. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Will Hewlings, and I live downtown. So I'm gonna be speaking about number one. Uh, I'm for number one, but again, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, when we were talking about SBD um, having uh, Mach-E's and Tesla's basically making it to where now they can buy a ICE com internal combustion engines, well, I'm, I'm all for this, but as I mentioned, when I left city council meeting, I walked out and I'm not the only one that's seen this. Someone's aide, uh, Councilman Cathcart's aide Shea, also seen the same thing I've seen, but Water Department has a Ford Mach-E. Now, if you don't know what a Ford Mach-E, maybe you should look it up. Fully electric, they're nice and stuff, they're, you know, uh, it kind of, uh, was eye-opening. So I called the next day and spoke to the, the whoever it is for the city. And I asked him, like, what's up with your uh, city having Ford mach for the water department? He said, I know this is what we're required to buy. He, he told me they also have Teslas. And then I'm like, well, so do, are you for that? He's like, not really because I can't even, we can't even put a, a, a sledgehammer into a back of a Mach-E. I'm like, well, why, can't, why aren't you guys buying diesels? Well, obviously now they're gonna be able to buy diesels, which is a good, but, um, so I mean, that's just my only uh, thought on that, you know, and I looked up, actually, I looked up uh, Corwin Ford has, F-250 work, four-wheel drive, diesels, they're $66,000. And I know that doesn't include probably the, you know, the box and all the other stuff. So, I mean, that looks about right. But anyways, that's it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Can Go I ahead. make a comment real quick? Because I actually, Will, before you came up, I was going to talk about number one because you're right. You can find that vehicle for $65,000, $70,000, but there is a lot of upfitting required for it to, to make it. So uh, the two hundred eighty-five, it's not ninety-five, dollars just for the vehicle. It's the vehicle and all the equipment that goes with it. And so I know it, it looks expensive, and it is, but it's, it's to tailor it for their specific needs. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Jacoby tells me I don't need a motion. All those in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. 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 And any opposed? All right. So moving on, we have some special budget ordinances. Ordinance C36446, amending ordinance number C36345, passed by the City Council December 12, 2022, and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2023 making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2023, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declaring an emergency and appropriating funds in. General Fund number one, add two classified community justice specialist positions from five to seven. A, there is no change to the overall appropriation level in the general fund. This action arises from the need to create grant-funded positions. Okay. We don't have anyone signed up. Uh, any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. Great, thank you. you My vote didn't, right. sorry. No. Okay. <laughs> no do -overs. Let's try again. Prepare to vote. There you go. All right. And next up is... Um, the Lincoln Heights, do you want to read that? Mm, I didn't read SPO. this. Yeah. Second one. Oh, SPO? Okay, <clears throat> go ahead. 
Ordinance C-36447, miscellaneous grants fund, number one, increased revenue by $455,985. A, of the increased revenue, $455,985 is provided by the Environmental Protection Agency via sub-award through Gonzaga University. Number two, increased appropriation by $455,985. A, of the increased appropriation, $455,985 is provided solely for equipment repair and maintenance. This section arises from the need to accept the EPA sub-award for HVAC maintenance at the Northeast Community Center. No one has signed up. Do we have council commentary? Go ahead. I'll just say self-explanatory that they got this grant award. It's just amazing. One less fund we have to from the city. Yes, agree. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Prepare to vote. You did it. All right, and then next is the uh, 20230084. Go ahead and read that. Resolution 2023-84, adding a Lincoln Heights project to the Spokane Plan Commission's 2022-2023 work program. Okay, we have two people signed up. Carol Tomsick, come on up. Okay, and I'm Carol Tomsick. I'm with the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council. And I'd like to say a pedestrian street designation will ensure that commercial and residential development on 29th from Martin Street to 5th Street supports a walkable environment. The resolution will not affect the traffic lanes. It's a zoning change. The Lincoln Heights Neighborhood District Center Plan supports neighborhood-oriented businesses that cater to folks who walk, bike, and take the bus, not auto-oriented businesses on an already auto-congested street, for example, a restaurant with a 50-car drive through The safety of our residents is a priority for our council. Pedestrian safety on 29th was voted a priority on our neighborhood traffic calming program. We have an RRFB installed at the crosswalk of 29th and Rosars this fall, a hawk light at 29th and Fisk, is on the traffic common for your list. We have a transit park and ride and a high performance route in our district center. We have bicycle greenway on Fisk between 27 to 34th and plan to add more bicycle paths in our district center. There is a proposed 96 unit residential multifamily development in our district center. We will have 236 residential units constructed in a pedestrian oriented plan unit development in our district center. The pedestrian street designation is necessary as we continue to work on making our district center safe, walkable, and bicycle friendly for our current and future residents. Our neighborhood council and residents will advocate for the pedestrian street <coughs> designation with the plan commission. It is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. It is consistent with our district center plan. It is consistent with the South Hill 2014 connectivity and livability strategic plan. It is consistent with the center and corridor's intent for a safe pedestrian environment and a safe and healthy environment where the pedestrian is a pride or T is a design objective and a design guideline for public projects and structures. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Justin Holler. Did he leave? Yeah. Oh. Other ways. Um, uh, 84, right? This is the pedestrian street. Pedestrian street. Yeah. Um, you guys allocated $300,000 towards rainbow crosswalks when you didn't understand how much they cost. And you allocated 300000 for six of them, which is 50000 And 50000 was not allocated. Only 10000 was allocated. And when the lowest bid was 5000 and I reiterate, I know two people who paint for a living who could have gotten it done for 5000 give me a kickback, and had money for a steak dinner. So that being said, where's the 40000 on that? And where is the money coming from? Where is the money going? How much of it is going to be wasted on yet another useless project? We already have a bunch of donuts and a bunch of skid marks. And even your own city people have painted over part of the rainbow crosswalk. Yet Point of there, order. There's a paint shortage. Yes. Um, I'm not sure this is relating to this ordinance. It's it, not. 
It, it, it is in the fact that it's, it's one more project that probably doesn't need to have happen. But is it an immediate and dire need? Is it regarding potholes? Is it going would, to fix anything useful? Yeah, point of order. I would say that it's, it's fair to talk about this, but the, the painted crosswalks aren't, aren't, aren't connected to this. This is, this is just setting a pedestrian, um, a pedestrian street to change the zoning to where you can't have commercial projects it's in there study. anymore. It's okay. a study, excuse me, yes, yeah, just the study. So. And how much is a study costing? You know, mm -hmm. that, that's the thing. How much does everything cost? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very frustrating to see the money wasted with all these projects. And it, it does come together because you guys spend our money. You guys create these projects, like for the fluoride thing. You're paying money to study whether or not fluoride is poisonous. It was used by Nazis. If you want to associate yourself with what Nazis did, then that's a great idea. If not, maybe don't. Um, but when I was a kid, I didn't have crosswalks. I, I learned how to play Frogger. I dodged things. You can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. You know, um, I understand that there are some people who aren't as quick, but maybe look into whether or not the people need it or want it before you spend money on it. And definitely, definitely, definitely take different bids before you allocate money for it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. All right. Council commentary. Please go ahead. Um, I'm in full support of this, and I just appreciate all the many residents of this area who have sent in emails. I think I personally have talked to over a dozen folks who also have shared their thoughts. So I just appreciate how engaged this neighborhood has been in this process. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I was going to uh, echo the same sentiments. This neighborhood has been very active about pedestrian safety, bicycle safety. It wasn't just a few people. They voted on it. They sent us a letter. As Carol mentioned, this has been over a number of years that they've been asking for this, and it is going to the plan commission as part of their work plan. So as far as we know, there's no additional cost to this to do this study. And then when it comes back, we will have the overall um, thoughts on what plan commission thinks, and then we'll go forward from there. But this is a very active neighborhood council, and I have to respect their wishes to have this looked at. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Go ahead. I was just going to add that this is what neighborhood councils do, mm -hmm. and they have been talking about this for a very long time. It's part of their neighborhood plan, I believe. So this is the process, and I'm glad to see it at this point, and I'm happy to support it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was just going to... Shout out Carol for being here again and you know continuing to advocate for your neighborhoods. Uh, if we had 29 of you, then every neighborhood would be heard, so very well done, and yes. yeah. Anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna get a little wonky here. Um, first of all, two people have died in the recent years trying to cross 29th, they were elderly, and as some of you recall, there is a uh, apartment complex on one side of the street, Rose Hours is on the other, the residents are elderly, so they're not gonna just zip across 29th to get to Rosars. So two people have already died. We don't want any more. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what is a pedestrian street. It is a street designated on the official zoning map as a pedestrian street where development standards are required to promote a pedestrian friendly street. Pedestrian streets offer a pleasant and safe walking environment. Design features include minimal interruptions of the sidewalks by driveways, publicly usable site furnishing, furnishings such as benches, tables, and bike racks, and visually interesting buildings close to the sidewalk. The designation of a pedestrian street under the zoning code does not directly impact the function or design of the road, and I think that is important. It's not gonna narrow lanes or eliminate right. any lanes. Public Works does not use these definitions when making design decisions about road design traffic calming projects, crosswalks, or any other consideration. A pedestrian street only impacts adjacent property if it is in a center and corridor zone, which this is. There are no pedestrian streets outside of a designated, designated center and corridor, but if there were, it would have no effect. And pedestrian streets impose limitations and requirements on adjacent property, such as drive-through businesses are not allowed, driveways and curb cuts are limited, and buildings must meet additional design standards. So it's pretty benign. It's not going to cost money. It's just going to be the standard going forward. So Carol Thompson, you're a, a hero for your neighborhood, 
and for advocating. And remember, this is a very congested area, so we'd like to make it as easy for people to get around as possible. So thank you all for your comments. Prepare to vote. Great, thank you. All right, and next is 0085. Resolution 2023-85 regarding temporary wastewater bypass from the City of Airway Heights and ratifying letter of agreement dated September 1, 2023. We have no uh, community comment. Do we have any comment from the, all right, do you have your hand up? I'm ready to vote. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> real, real quick, our, our neighbor needs our assistance and I'm happy to help, so look forward to it. Anybody Same. else? Same. All right. Are you trying to finish at a certain time? Is that the deal? No. We should sing We Are the World. We can play that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Prepare to vote. There we go. Thank you. And next is uh, relating to the regulation. It's uh, C36444 relating to the regulation of massage and reflexology businesses. And but, before you start, oh. I just want to give a shout out to um, Ginny Ramos, who is... Uh, assisting me and to Chris Wright who worked long and hard on this and many many others so go ahead Terry ordinance C 36444 relating to the regulation of massage and reflexology businesses and establishing a process for the denial or revocation of business licenses due to Ill illegal activity adopting a new chapter 10.78 amending chapter 8.01 by adding a new section 8.01.320 and amending section 4.04.050 of the Spokane Municipal Code we have no community commentary. Do we have do we have council commentary? I just want to add that the City of the Valley already has theirs. We took ours from Kent. And I also want to thank um, one of our detectives for alerting us to this and asking for our help. Without that, we would have no knowledge that we had a problem. So, yes. And do you want to talk a little bit about what this is in intending us to, to help stop. Yes, and so it is intended to stop human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So it requires that you do have certification to be a massage mm -hmm. therapist or reflexologist. And what we're seeing now are women coming over, typically from China. The organization is based on the west side, bringing women over here to ostensibly do massage, but there are other things that they do. And so this is curbing that activity. And so it's important on a, number of, on a number of ways because we know human trafficking also goes hand in hand with drugs and weapons. So we might be hitting three with one. Okay, any other comments? All right, prepare to vote. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. We are at the end of our agenda. And Jacoby is not correct. It's not 7.15. I'm sorry. You missed it by a few. Um, so we will see you here, same time, same place, next week. Have a great week, everyone. We're adjourned.